Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Karen Chalfont, COO of Silverthread, and I couldn't be more excited about what we have in store for you today. We're thrilled to present Jean Kim, a renowned researcher and author. Jean has been studying high-performance technology organizations since 1999. He was the founder and CTO of Tripwire, an enterprise security software company for 13 years. He's the best-selling author of Wiring, the Winning Organization, The Unicorn Project, and was co-author of The Phoenix Project, The DevOps Handbook, and the Shingo Publication Award-winning Accelerate. Dr. Dan Sturdivant is co-founder and CEO of Silverthread, which commercialized MIT and Harvard Research on the modernization and simplification of complex software systems. His efforts center around understanding the impact of code architecture on a team's competitiveness and success exploring how this architecture shapes productivity, defects, and staff turnover. He has assessed and provided guidance for hundreds of commercial and government code bases as they have navigated the journey towards organizational improvement. This upcoming dynamic dialogue isn't just about theory, it's about real world application. We're going to explore the intersection of organizational strategies and the evolving landscape of development practices. Both Gene and Dan, share a common passion for software architecture, and their discussion will not only touch upon case studies, but also delve into the underlying theory of why software architecture plays a pivotal role in technology and organizational performance. Before we dive into this enlightening conversation, a quick note, please feel free to share any questions in the Q&A tab, and we will do our best to address them during our Q&A session at the end. Now let's welcome our distinguished guests, Jean Kim and Dr. Dan Sturdivant, as they navigate the intersection of theory and practice in the world of software development. Jean and Dan, over to you. Hey, thank you, Karen. Thanks, Jean. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be kind of running this as a dialogue between Jean and I just to talk about our um, respective work over the years on this topic. And I'm really excited to be here and really excited that you've joined us, so thank you. Oh, I'm delighted to be here, Dan, and uh, so much excited uh, to share some of the learnings we've had over the past year that we've been corresponding. So uh, looking forward to this amazing uh, hour ahead. Great. Thanks, Gene. So let's talk about software. And a lot of you have been working on very large projects. Um, and a lot of you, if you've been in the industry for a long time, have experienced a lot of pain. The odds that you haven't are extremely low because only 7% of projects are really successful. Right? That means they're on time within budget and deliver the functionality that they set out to originally deliver. Now, when people talk about these challenges, the first thing that you're going to reflexively look at is the people, right? People are going to blame each other. They're going to say, our leaders are stupid. Our team members are stupid. we got to fire them all and, and, and get better people, right? And, and uh, you know, that might be a little cathartic, but I think it's probably too simplistic, right? So the next thing that people tend to focus on is process, right? Maybe we're using old bad processes are just not using them at all. And we need to use Agile and DevOps better and, and do better measurement. And, and if we do that, then everything will be better. But one of the things we're talking about today and highlighting is the fact that um, an often unrecognized uh, cause of the challenges you experience on software projects, especially as they grow in age, is the actual complexity of that asset itself, right? That's the thing that creates value. It's the thing that you ship and deliver. And it's the thing that these developers are working in every day. So it's no surprise. It shouldn't surprise anyone that it is actually one, of the, one if not the dominant driver of the economics of your project. Um, but people tend not to measure it. They tend not to understand or appreciate it as much. And, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, now, here is uh, a little bit of the research that we've done. Uh, Silverthread started uh, based as a, uh, a research group out of MIT and Harvard, and we've published a lot of papers on this, these topics that are downloadable from our website. So what is software and why is it hard, right? One of the things to understand is that you know, there are engineers who design electromechanical physical systems every day. There are people like mechanical engineers and aerospace engineers who designed this Apollo 11 lander, for example. And it's really tough to build that, but one of the, the things that you have going for you is that 60% of the human brain is dedicated to processing visual information and having a qualitative understanding of physics. And for that reason, everyone in that organization will know that if it has rust, you have to fix it. If one of those legs is bolted on the top, you have to fix it. You can see the architectural problems right off the bat. 
Now, what you see next to that is Margaret Hamilton. She's credited with inventing the term software engineering. Um, she was the person in charge of the development of the 11, Apollo 11 software. And she's standing next to that software uh, printed out on a stack of paper uh, in the picture. Now, one of the things about software is that it is not three-dimensional. It can't be seen. You can't use that 60% of your brain to understand the structure of that software. And so you have to bring other tools to bear, which make it harder to deal with. Now, if you look at a modern software system, say something with 100 million lines of code, it's much bigger than that code base that Margaret and her team wrote. If you um, looked at 100 million lines of code and you printed it out on notebook paper, it would be one and a half miles into the air. So if you think about your software development organization, let's say you have hundreds or thousands of people working in a big code base, every individual human can only understand a piece of that stack that might be a foot large, maybe 10 feet if they're really good. But think about how much of your code base is uncovered by any human brain that's currently working in your organization. That's the problem you're dealing with. You have a massive complex system. You think that you understand the architecture of this system, but the reality is that no one really does. So how do we cope with that? Right? How do we deal with that issue? And how do we deal with the fact that software is the most complex thing that humans have ever set out to create? Now, we've done studies on the relationships between architecture and business outcomes. In unhealthy architectures, we found that, um, you know, in this one case, they were developing eight features per year per person and spending 70% of their time fixing bugs in the unhealthy part of a code base. In the healthy part of uh, the code base in that same system, developers were making 20 features a year and they were only spending one day a week fixing bugs. So there are dramatic economic differences between the performance of your organization when your developers are dealing with code that's difficult to work with versus code that's great to work with. Another thing that we found in a study we did, there is almost a 10x difference in the rate at which developers quit or are fired based on the architectural health of the code that they're working in. If your life is good because you understand the changes that you make, you are not dealing with many defects and your managers are happy with you, then you've got a good life. If you don't, then you might look for somewhere else to work. Gene, I know that you love this slide. Um, you know, so. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal statistic. Uh, because, and this is, I think, where uh, you and I really hit it off because uh, this piece of evidence, I love the, they say the goal of science is to explain observable phenomena, confirm deeply held intuitions and reveal surprising insights. And uh, this gives, uh, validates something that we felt that it is terrible to work in uh, non-modular code bases. It's bad for the organization and it's bad for the people and the people ultimately responsible for the architecture are the leaders of the organization. So uh, I, uh, this is just one of the many learnings I've had interacting with uh, you and uh, getting learning more about this body of research that uh, you've been a part of for decades. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because a lot of this conversation is going to be around economics. We're going to be talking about productivity and defects and, and agility and things like that. But I think we have to appreciate there's a real human cost to this, right? People get burnt out, right? People go home and, and you know, they don't have good days, right? So if, if we can make people's lives better while they're working with these systems, you know, it makes everyone happier across the entire industry. So uh, I think that's important. Absolutely. In fact, before I go into my research, I mean, I think uh, my interpretation of this is that people are misattributing uh, the performance of the system to the person when in fact it is the architecture. And I think, uh, Dan, if it's okay with you, how about I go into the research that I've done in the yeah. state of DevOps research that so much mirrors your findings? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want me to Fantastic. So uh, if you go, yeah, for sure. Let's go into the uh, business value of DevOps. So this is um, something that I'm just most professionally proud of in my career, which is um, a project called the State of DevOps Research. It's a cross population study that spanned over 36,000 respondents um, that, um, and our goal for the six years was figure out what are the, um, uh, what does high performance look like and what are the behaviors and predictors of performance. And so this is uh, the definition of DevOps that we put into uh, the DevOps handbook. And so that was probably one of the biggest surprises in my journey uh, in the 25 year journey studying high performing technology organizations. Um, and uh, that DevOps is really this way to help uh, developers ship code uh, quickly into production, preserve operational reliability and stability uh, while preserving world-class reliability and security. And so the definition that we put in the DevOps handbook is, is architecture practices, it's technical practices and cultural norms that enable us to win in the marketplace. 
uh, the next slide, uh, Dan, uh, there's another definition that I love that comes from my friend, John Smart. And uh, he said, it's simply the ability to deliver better value sooner, safer, and happier. <laughs> and I love that because it's so difficult to argue against because I think even your biggest DevOps skeptic, your biggest uh, uh, hater of architecture will say, will not claim that they want less value later with more danger and more misery. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I think it just does a wonderful job in articulating what we're trying to do when we say we want to do things in, in a better way. So if you build out the next slide, um, the, the key findings in the state of DevOps research uh, that I did with Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Jez Humble uh, from 2013 to 2019 was that uh, we found that high performers uh, are massively outperforming their non-high performing peers. So the four metrics, stand are deployment frequency. The high performers are doing daily, you know, multiple deployments two orders of magnitude more frequently than the peers. And more importantly, they can um, get to deployment uh, far quicker. Uh, they can go from code committed to version control through integration, through testing, uh, through deployment. So customers are saying thank you in one hour or less. Again, two orders of magnitude faster than the peers. Uh, when they do a deployment, they are seven times more likely to succeed without causing a SEV1 outage, a, secure, uh, a service impairment, a security breach or a compliance failure. And uh, when bad things go wrong, uh, they can fix it in one hour or less, three orders of magnitude faster than their peers. So uh, to see this amazing performance difference uh, was astonishing. We saw it six years in a row. So on the next slide, Dan, uh, we see that there are other dimensions of quality. We find that because organizations are integrating information security objectives into everyone's daily work, they're spending only one half the amount of time remediating security issues. Uh, on the next slide, um, we can see organizational performance, something that uh, Dan has uh, alluded to. These high performers um, win in the marketplace. Next slide, Dan. They're twice as, li as likely to exceed profitability and market share goals. Goals. And for not-for-profits, government agencies, military services, same multiple of performance. They're twice as likely to achieve organizational and mission goals, regardless of how they define it, whether it's measured by customer satisfaction, quantity, or quality. And so really, the uh, findings are so clear. If uh, a mission achievement requires work that we do in the technology value stream, then DevOps helps with the achievement of those objectives. Next slide. Other markers of organizational performance. Um, Employees were twice as likely to recommend their organizations as a great place to work to their colleagues and friends, <laughs> right? So uh, you don't uh, do that unless if, uh, you enjoy your work and you know, want your friends to join you. Uh, and so this is highly correlated with market growth, profitability, and so forth. So the employee net promoter score. So next slide, uh, you know, what does it all say to me beyond the numbers? It's, you know, to what degree can we safely, quickly, reliably, securely achieve all the goals, dreams, and aspirations of the organizations uh, that we serve? Um, and so, uh, Dan, can you go to uh, Architecture Enables Teams 2? Um, one of the things that we found uh, that was one of the biggest aha moments for me was uh, that the top predictor performance was architecture uh, as measured by what? To what degree can teams do large scale changes to their parts of the system without permission from anyone else outside of their team? To what degree can they complete their work without a lot of fine grained communication and coordination with people outside of their team? To what extent can they deploy and release their service on demand, independent of services it depends upon, which is actually pretty astonishing. And uh, to what extent can they do their own testing on demand uh, without using a scarce integrated test environment? So uh, they can test a component isolated from every other component, uh, which uh, if you don't do that, you are coupled to everyone else in the enterprise, which is not so good because it deprives you of independence of action. And you know, if all those things are true, we should be able to do deployments during normal business hours with negligible downtime. And so uh, during my days at Trip, I was there for 13 years. I was a technical co-founder. I was a CTO. And uh, during my day, uh, we said it's always safe to ignore architects, especially chief architects, because everyone knew <laughs> during those days that uh, you know these were the people who lived in an ivory tower and the only thing they did was publish once a year a PowerPoint slide that, that would email to everybody and, and they would go back to their ivory power, tower not to be seen again for another year. And so this was just a polite way of saying they didn't impact the daily work of development uh, or engineering. And if that were true, <laughs> if were ever true, it's certainly not true now because what this finding shows is that there's nothing that impacts more the work of engineers than architecture. Um, so if you go to the uh, next slide, um, you know everything I've talked about, uh, you can actually predict with uh, startling accuracy, but just by asking one simple question, and it's on the next slide. It is on a scale of one to seven, to what degree do we fear doing deployments? <laughs> and so 
So uh, one is we have no fear at all. Uh, we just did one. Seven is we have existential fear of doing deployments, which shows how good the brain is at associating fear with problematic activities. Um, and so it's not just about uh, deployment, right? It's everything before deployment. It's about the integration. It's about the test. It's about the build. And all of this architecture matters. Uh, Dan, I have to imagine this resonates with you. And if so, why? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, getting a, a release out, doing a deployment absolutely is, is uh, I think, one of the um, key things that you could look at an organization and see how, how well they work. You know, we've, um, you know, from a DevOps perspective, rapid deployment, agile development, um, we've done analysis of, of hundreds of, of systems uh, in the government, in the DOD, in the commercial space. One of the things you might want to look at is an IEEE um, article that I wrote in, in 2018 that goes through a lot of those findings um, that show that architecture really is one of the key drivers of agility. And, and the question is why, this is another book by um, Carlos Baldwin, who uh, Gene and I both know, um, Harvard Business School professor, um, who analyzed the relationship between modularity and, and, and business outcomes. And it should be obvious, if you've got a system that's structured in a way that um, different teams are working on different sections of code that are highly cohesive and loosely coupled to each other in some kind of um, well-understood hierarchy, then you're doing great because the system can evolve in a healthy way and people can understand it. Unfortunately, when, we, when we've measured code, we found that 80% of systems actually, to some degree or another, look more like this. It's bad, it hurts you, but it can be fixed if you do it in a, in a managed way. Um, we've looked at thousands of, of systems. Here's some uh, quality metrics from a design or architecture standpoint and a business outcome analysis standpoint. Um, and we've benchmarked systems. You know, Here's some benchmarks around modularity and how that couples to agility of an organization and and bug labor percent, for example. Um, so, uh, totally resonates, Gene. <coughs> awesome. And by the way, I apologize that my uh, audio and video is poor. Uh, in Portland, Oregon, we're having unprecedented ice storms, <laughs> and uh, uh, many people don't have power, and I haven't had internet all week. So, uh, um, yeah, my apologies. All right. So, what I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes is share some of my favorite case studies of uh, that show how powerful. Uh, architecture is to performance. And so uh, my favorite example is Amazon. So in 1998, um, if you look at the product um, page, you can see there's books and music and, and a handful of others. And so life is uh, pretty simple then. But by 2002, on the next slide, uh, it's books, music, toys and electronics, and 35 other product categories. And so uh, now life is not so good because on the next slide, what this does is that it created a situation where uh, teams became too coupled uh, to each other. And so you have the e-commerce team. So that's things like product page, um, you know, ordering, returns, inventory. And then you have the product team. So books, music, uh, apparel, and 35 other different product categories. And so if all these teams have to talk to each other to get things done, uh, eventually you lose freedom of action. So on the next slide, uh, you'll see this amazing quote from Dr. Werner Vogels, then CTO of Amazon, still CTO of Amazon. And he described this ridiculous situation that they found themselves in, uh, where uh, in this case, it was the Amazon digital teams who could not um, uh, get around the fact that when you bought a digital product, you still had to provide a physical shipping address, <laughs> which is you know uh, pretty absurd uh, since that uh, you're, you're not actually shipping anything. Uh, and he said that uh, the digital teams would go to 60 different ordering teams and ask for changes, but the response that they would hear is, we haven't budgeted for it, and so now they were stuck. And so you can actually see the results of this uh, on the next slide, where uh, of the results of losing this independence of action. In the late 90s, uh, they were doing thousands of deployments per year, right, because uh, it was a simpler system. By 2001, it had almost ground to a halt. They were only doing tens of deployments per year. In fact, most deployments did not finish because something was going wrong uh, in the deployment process. So uh, this became intolerable. And this actually led to the next slide, the $1 billion Amazon API rearchitecture, where Jeff Bezos said, we want teams no larger than can be fed by two pizzas uh, that can be independently working on Amazon's largest problems. Um, and so the way we're going to get there is by re-architecting Amazon, um, you know, spending a billion dollars doing this. Um, I, I think that's on the next slide, uh, Dan, uh, where he put out this shocking memo as reported by Steve Yegi, 
uh, where he said um, all teams must henceforth communicate only through APIs. <laughs> that um, number two is um, the only form of interprocess communication is through the APIs. No backdoors. Uh, uh, Jeff Bezos doesn't care whether you use HTTP, Corba, PubSub. He does not care. Uh, service interfaces must, without exception, be designed from the ground up to be externalizable. Anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. And he ends by saying, thank you and have a nice day. So on the next build, uh, Steve Yeggy reports that number seven is obviously a joke because uh, Jeff Bezos doesn't care whether you have a good day or not. Um, next, uh, next build, uh, Dan. And this is all enforced by then Amazon CIO Rick Dalzell, a former Army U.S. Ranger. So uh, the result of this uh, is that uh, on the next slide, the Amazon results are uh, by 2001, right? We talked about them doing only tens of deployments per year. By 2011, um, as you can see in the slide, uh, they are doing 15,000 deployments per day, as <laughs> reported by Jenkins, which shocked the world. And uh, Dan, you should see on 2015, uh, they are uh, doing 136,000 deployments per day. So, uh, you know, deployments per day is uh, maybe not the best performance measure, but it is an amazing indicator of, you know, are small teams able to independently develop, test, and deploy functionality to customers? And from tens of deployments per year to 136,000 deployments per day is just a shocking example of uh, creating independence of action through modularity. Um, and so, Dan, in my mind, uh, the picture on the next slide is kind of like what code bases become. They become highly entangled, intertwined, which is bad, but it's not as what it becomes on the next slide where <laughs> it gets even worse, uh, where even small changes require superheroic effort. And even then, if you blow it, you take down the entire site. Um, and so through modularization by creating hard interfaces between teams, uh, you regain independence of action. And that's the next slide, right, where you can make changes safely locally and if bad things happen uh you small storms stay small right they don't ripple out and cause you know cascading failures globally uh before i go on dan how am i doing does this resonate with your own experience oh absolutely um i, I loved your picture with the the tangled up um server room because that's what the code is like it's just people can't see it right um, and so people can't recognize that you've got to do what's in this picture nearly as soon as you would in a physical system. Super, super. Yeah, so uh, Amazon is famous. They're one of the tech giants, right? Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, right? Uh, so they're capable of doing this. How about for you know more traditional organizations? And so on the next slide, uh, this is uh, one of the things I'm uh, also so, so proud of uh, being a part of. I've been running a conference called the DevOps Enterprise Summit. Uh, you can see the histogram on the right. And so uh, since 2014, we've run 19 conferences uh, where we had over uh, 1,500 leaders from over 600 large complex organizations that have been around for decades or even centuries across uh, almost every industry vertical uh, for your uh, entertainment and amusement. Uh, some of the oldest organization that presented was Barclays, founded in the year 1695, which actually predates the invention of paper cash. But the absolute oldest organization who presented was UK HMRC, His Majesty's Revenue and Custom Service, that was founded in the year 1200. <laughs> so there's uh, probably no code that goes that, goes, that goes that far back, but there's certainly uh, values, traditions, maybe even processes that certainly go back centuries. So let me share with you some of my absolute favorite uh, examples of how technology leaders have re-architected their systems that create all these wonderful modular characteristics that Dan has spent a decades studying um, with some of the best in the game. So uh, the next slide is Heather Mickman uh, from Target. Uh, she is, uh, at the time, she was Senior Director of Development at uh, Target. Uh, she was part of the DevOps transformation where they went from thousands of engineers all outsourced to one where they had reinsourced uh, them back into the organization. Uh, but the particular place where uh, she had responsibility was something called the API enablement program. And the business problem that she set out to solve was this, was that every time a developer or a dev team wanted access to a system of record, you know, there's 300 of them for pricing, promotions, uh, catalog, uh, orders, um, all of those required an integration team to set up point-to-point -point integrations. And that would take somewhere between six to nine months. And that became intolerable. And so uh, she created a next uh, generation uh, no 
SQL database to basically copy all that information into it. Uh, so you can add, store, modify data, and it would synchronize it back with those de- uh, backend systems and do it cheaply. Uh, in fact, for many of these systems, because you paid by the MIPS, <laughs> you couldn't afford to uh, uh, retrieve information all the time. Uh, by 2016, she had 180 engineers working on this capability because they were creating versioned APIs that allowed teams to get all this of the data on demand without dealing with integration teams. Uh, through versioned APIs, which decoupled uh, the teams from each other. Uh, some of the most strategic programs in the organization depended upon this, including ship to store. So if you are trying to compete against Amazon, this is one of the most strategic capabilities you are trying to build to uh, to uh, beat the competition. All of the in-store applications that employees used, uh, use this technology. Uh, the Pinterest integration, Starbucks integration, all of them use this app. And so the fact that there are 180 engineers dedicated to um, this platform shows how strategic uh, this capability was. And this is, uh, make no doubt, make no doubt, this is an architectural change they made to it. It doesn't look like code architecture so much, but it is uh, architecture at the macro scale. Uh, does this resonate with you, Dan? Oh, absolutely. Um, these systems become massive. And it's, I think of this more as a human problem than an architectural problem. It's like, how do you how do you organize the people into teams and then have that map to um, the the code bases that they're working in and the infrastructure that they're working in at large scale? Um, we see this everywhere. Absolutely. All right, next slide. Another large retailer, Walmart. And so this is uh, Scott Havens, uh, Director of Engineering. Uh, he was formerly at uh, Jet.com, uh, then uh, became part of Walmart. And his remit was to rewrite the supply chain systems for the world's largest, not just retailer, the world's largest company <laughs> with uh, you know, over, over a million employees. So uh, the business problem they set out to solve was this, is that for their um, for their e-commerce product page uh, to uh, deliver the item availability, is this available for you to order? <laughs> it required 52 deeply nested API calls. So you can see the call graph um, in the uh, bottom. And so what this meant is that, um, you know, you have to have 52 services running at five, uh, four to five nines of availability, all which would respond at uh, within 50 milliseconds. And so, uh, you know, if they didn't, right, uh, the customer would might not buy the product. And so this is incredibly expensive. If any one of those systems come down um, or are slow, right, customers can order or won't wait around to order. And so this, again, uh, even though these are, uh, technically, they are decoupled services. The fact that they are so dependent upon each other is another nature of coupling uh, because they had uh, they have runtime coupling. And so um, the fact that they couldn't deploy independently because they had to deploy um, these uh, changes one at a time because if anything went wrong, how do you isolate uh, which service is actually responsible for the problem, right? So even though it, on an org chart, on a video diagram, it might look decoupled, but absolutely by their behaviors, uh, you could tell that these are actually had huge runtime coupling. So what do they do about this? Uh, they move the entire uh, 52 services from uh, these 52 nested API calls to a pub sub queue. Uh, so they're using uh, they're using Apache Kafka, uh, and so instead of calling the information, they would post information, and they would be retrieved. And what this is astonishing, this relaxed the requirements of each one of these services from 50 milliseconds to three to five seconds, um, and from five to four nines to potentially even three nines. Um, and this, uh, he even told a story about how they uh, re- survived uh, the entire Kafka cluster being destroyed. <laughs> they rebuild it from scratch uh, mm-hmm. within you know a half hour. And so this is something that absolutely could not be done before reorienting the architecture from tightly coupled nested calls to loosely coupled through event queues. Uh, This saved millions, maybe tens of millions of dollars uh, because of the relaxed uptime requirements and the relaxed compute requirements. Um, And it's easier for developers as well because now they don't have to test in a integrated test environment they can use unit testing to simulate um you know retrieving certain types of messages and posting certain type of messages without actually changing uh and mutating state in a database uh dan does this resonate with you yes sir absolutely the the runtime uh, modularization is just as important as as uh, build time or test time um you know to to be able to scale 
Super, so. super. All right, I got one more for you, and this is for um, uh, people in uh, DoD and government. And uh, this is actually one of the most audacious engineering uh, feats I've ever seen. This is called Project Fox. Uh, oh, Allison, by the way, all of these talks are available at the uh, um, we're given at DevOps Enterprise, and the talks are available for you to watch, and they are in the URLs. Uh, in the slide decks that will be uh, distributed out. So this is Omar Morales and uh, Jaron Lemke. So uh, this was actually came, um, it was an idea of, uh, came from an Air Force uh, uh, reservist. And the idea was to put an app store in the F-35 and isolate it from the safety critical systems. And so the idea was that, you know, uh, small shops could generate apps, they could deploy in the app store and it wouldn't trigger recertif recertification of the flight systems or uh, put them through a certification process that safety critical systems have to go through. They could, because they were isolated from um, the rest of the environment. So the inputs would come in from sensors, the outputs would potentially go to munitions. And uh, this was such a shocking success that uh, it, because it decoupled uh, these application developers from the rest of the system. Uh, it was so successful. They actually prototyped this in F 22 They actually got it running F 22 the same day, despite having never, never seen one, never got access to a simulator. <laughs> and, and because they saw the, this as a potential to potentially give helmet mounted, uh, systems to the F 22 that the, um, that have been tried twice before, <laughs> but it couldn't be done because, um, you know, it required, uh, Boeing together, right, to develop this small piece of functionality. Uh, and I actually learned when they presented a year and a half ago that this was so successful that uh, they're now um, investigating onto uh, A10s, which I think are really is really funny because I didn't know that they had uh, DC power. <laughs> anyway, it just shows that you know, mark of great modularity enables unprecedented agility, incredible resilience, uh, and the ability to truly unleash and uh, liberate people's creativity, problem-solving efforts. We can now change smaller parts of the system independently of everyone else. Dan, does it resonate with your own experience? Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, things like medical devices, things like um, code bases where some pieces of them need to be classified. If you can modularize the system and structure it properly, then you can um, minimize the amount of work that you have to do or the pain that you have to suffer to, to maintain your um, reliability, safety, security standards um, if you're intelligent about it. So especially in... in uh, uh, highly critical systems, thinking this through can can really improve things. Brilliant. Over to you. All right. Well, let me talk about a few of the examples that uh, that we've um, looked at it in Silverthread. Right here's here's a case. This is a video game company that that I personally worked with, um, and this is a story about about architecture and how it impacted their business performance. Now, if you're a video game company, often you have a video game engine. Right? It, it contains things like physics subsystems, rendering subsystems, Xbox drivers, PlayStation drivers. This is a first-person shooter, so a very violent game. Now, um, on top of that engine, you might have independent game development teams in your company or somewhere else, all using that platform. And if we analyze the code, we would expect to see it uh, look something like this. I would see dependence from the game, you know, bad guy code, vehicle code, weapon code, on stuff in the engine, but we wouldn't expect to see any links go in the other direction. Unfortunately, the first time we went and we started scanning this code, found hundreds and hundreds of places where there were calls from, say, physics to bad guy. You can see the particular line of code and know where it is. So you scratch your head and you ask yourself, why is that? Well, we found out that um, you know there was some guy up in game one who invented an algorithm that was really cool. It was useful. Um, and then eventually the video game engine team decided that um, everyone needed to have that. That was something that was already on their roadmap. Now, it would have taken them an extra month to take it out of game one, refactor it, uh, pull it down, harden it, and then make it available. So instead, they just decided to call it directly from the code. And then again, this wasn't the only example. They had done it a lot. But here's the story of the kinds of problems that it caused. Now, imagine in May, three years later, um, and this, these kinds of things actually did happen, um, an engineer changes that algorithm in game one and does a local improvement that improves the performance of game one. All of those changes uh, get merged, go down, get um, you know, integrated into the um, queue for the engine team, and then uh, go up to game team two, and they start experiencing a critical defect. Now, um, this defect, they don't know where it came from. They spend a month debugging their own code trying to figure out what's going on. 
Then there's a cross-organizational team where it's the engine team and the UK-based team trying to figure out what's going on. And because there are two different organizations, they start fighting about it. They start pointing fingers and blaming each other until they finally realize that it's because of this unrecognized, uh, forgotten link up to code implemented in game one. Now it's October or November. They've got to scramble. And for the purposes of a Christmas release of a video game, uh, they've got to backport to an old version of game one and an old version of the engine for game two. And now they've got a problem in that they not only have a tangled up code base, they also have a major duplication issue. And they've got to pray on Christmas morning that the whole thing doesn't collapse. These are the kinds of problems that we are trying to uh, discuss today and the major kinds of problems that we're trying to help people avoid uh, by improving their architecture. Here's a picture of a, of a different video game organization that did go through a successful refactoring to modularize the code. And what you can see is that um, at the point where they successfully modularize their code, you see a massive uptick in the rate at which they can produce revenue generating games for this company. So this is not just about cost containment or productivity or quality. This is about top line growth um, and innovation for an organization. We've done a lot of work with the DoD as well. So um, we've looked across large portfolios of, of DoD systems and, and we found at the portfolio level, there are some systems that are in great shape, right? Those teams should be rewarded. You should give those people more work. We can, we can assess that. Um, there are some systems where it's economically rational to improve those systems and it's technically feasible to do so. And we've seen teams triple their productivity. And, and there are some systems that should be um, rewritten and thrown out, right? And if you can optimize this choice, there's a lot of money to be had. And here's a screenshot of a, a actual tooling that we have out of our product showing uh, technical health uh, benchmarks and software economic benchmarks. And then within that system, you know, here's uh, within that portfolio, here's one system that we looked at. This was a code base that was originally created in the 1960s. Um, in the 1980s, it went through a major rewrite, but not a major re-architecting. So it had accumulated technical debt and it continued to accumulate technical debt. And then somewhere around the early 2000s, a new requirement came along, right? Um, and that new requirement um, maybe added 20% of new functionality to this system. The contractor that owned this system bid on it and won hands down based on the argument that this legacy system um, already contained 80% of the functionality, so they would only have to spend 20% more to get what they wanted. The government went with it. Fast forward to um, maybe five to 10 years ago, and things had ground to a halt based on 50 years of technical health issues, but no one knew it, right? Um, people were not shipping uh, releases for, for years. Um, they started by blaming the people. They fired the leadership. They got a new team. They got a new company to maintain this code. That didn't fix it. Then they decided to blame the process. So they sent all of the developers to Scrum Master training. Um, that didn't <laughs> fix the issue. Then they thought, okay, well, maybe it's about um, code quality. So they used your typical code quality tools that look at individual lines of code for issues. They use things like Cast and Sonar and, and Fortify and check marks and, and, and a lot of the, the tools that you might think of when you want to look at individual files um, within the system in isolation to see if they're high quality. But this system scored incredibly well from a code quality perspective, nothing that would explain their total paralysis. I mean, they hadn't been able to compile it for three and a half years. We came in and did an architectural health and modularity <laughs> analysis and found that it was the most challenged system that we had ever seen. And then we did predictive analytics and found that um, it predicted uh, bugs off the charts. It also predicted that $860,000 of every million dollars spent would be wasted because of the friction in the development process um, based on the overwhelming degradation of the software architecture. Um, this analysis underpinned a multi-billion dollar strategic decision. So if you understand the architecture of your code and how that impacts your business performance, you can make better choices um, strategically, both within systems and, and across large portfolios. Um, another case study, right? This is a, an industry system uh, where they wanted to improve a system. They had a monolithic system and they wanted to go through a systematic process to decompose it and break it apart, not just the code, but also the infrastructure. And so it was a componentization effort. And here's an example of the an analysis I did, um, uh, you know, first results looking at the system. Uh, found places where version controlled files were being accessed, um, you know, not through their APIs, but um, instead, you know, violating those IPAs, APIs and going straight to the internals. Found other places where code that had been generated 
um, was accessed even though dependencies were missing. And what you can see over here is the absolute numbers of these kinds of violations and the types of risks associated with, with those sorts of violations. But in the first assessment found 420,000 violations of what I call the rules of modularity, um, which you know, can give you a roadmap for exactly what to do to break it apart. Now in the first month, a guy named John spent one month trying to go after as many as he could and he eliminated 30,000 issues. Second month went back and did an assessment and found that there were 430,000 issues. It was not converging and it wasn't converging because although John was doing great work, there were 999 other developers who had introduced 40,000 new issues into the system. So this emphasizes the um, reason that you need leadership and coordinated action to fix things. And you need locks, lockdowns in a, say a DevOps pipeline as, as you're developing. Oh, fantastic. And I apologize if I was laughing at some of these stories. It's not because it's funny, but it's because it's so familiar and potentially so universal. <laughs> so what I'd like to do in the next five minutes is just uh, share with you what I've learned um, working uh, in the last three years with uh, Dr. Steven Spear from the MIT Sloan School of Business. Uh, this is uh, not only Dan's alma mater, but uh, many of his mentors, uh, such as Dr. Carlos Baldwin, uh, Dr. Alan McCormick, all hailed from MIT. So if you go to the picture of... Uh, uh, Steve and me, and a couple of slides. Uh, this is uh, someone who uh, is uh, famous for his contribution to studying the Toyota production system. He wrote the uh, 1999 uh, Harvard Business Review article called Decoding the DNA of the Toyota Production System. And in support of uh, that, uh, he actually this is based on his doctoral dissertation at the Harvard Business School. Um, and in support of that work, he worked on the uh, plant floor of a tier one Toyota supplier for six months. And so uh, in the next slide, uh, the book that uh, we uh, released in November that we worked on for three years uh, is called Wiring the Winning Organization. And the quest that we were on is to understand why do organizations work the way they do, both in the ideal and not ideal, um, and understand on the next slide, what is in common between agile and DevOps, uh, the lean Toyota production system, safety culture, resilience engineering. And our conclusion is that they are all incomplete expressions of a far greater whole. And so um, this is the most intellectually challenging thing I've ever worked on in my life, but also the most rewarding because on the next slide, uh, it helped me see that there is this magic that winning organizations have, not just in software, but also in many manufacturing, engine design, nuclear reactor operations, healthcare, where winning organizations are able to do incredible things, more than any single individual could ever do alone, that liberate everyone's uh, creativity and problem-solving capabilities, versus those organizations that somehow constrain or even extinguish entirely the full capabilities of people within them. Right? And Dan's examples are so great that show where uh, we have created an architecture where no one can get anything done. And so on the next slide, uh, in the ideal, right, we want to be able to um, have people work independently of each other without massive levels of communication and coordination, um, as opposed to everyone being stuck, where even small things require superheroic effort and no one has what they need, when they need it, in the right format, at the right time, <laughs> and to get what they need, they have to talk to everybody instead of uh, ideally no one. Uh, and so this is the Amazon e-commerce uh, story that I uh, told earlier. So if you go to the first uh, slide with a couch, let me describe uh, you know, the metaphor that we use in the book. That uh, something I'm just uh, so proud of because it helped me understand these critical concepts of coupling and architecture and cohesion. And so uh, imagine you have two people trying to move a couch. Let's call them Steve and Gene. And you might think on the surface that this is all brawn work, no brain work allowed. And yet uh, they have to solve many challenging problems. They have to know, figure out where's the center of gravity to get through a narrow doorway around which axis do you rotate to get through a narrow set of stairs, uh, you know, around, you know, who's going to go first and do they face forwards or backwards? And there are all these things as leaders that we can do to make their jobs more difficult. For example, on the next slide, we can turn off all the lights. This will make the work take longer. <laughs> it will become more dangerous. They could damage the furniture or maybe even themselves. Or the next one is a little more subtle. We can uh, introduce a lot of background noise. Um, and so this creates a different uh, set of problems that's orthogonal to turning off the lights because it, it impedes their ability to communicate and coordinate. Uh, we can even on the next slide introduce an intermediary that prevent uh, Steve and Gene working directly with each other. And so uh, we might force them to work inside of JIRA tickets, um, work with account managers or even lawyers. And so at this point, uh, Steve and Gene can no longer work as a team. And I think all this evidence and stories that we've told today show that we can actually make it impossible for Steve and Gene to move the couch successfully. 
and because we have accidentally decoupled them for work that is highly coupled. And so on the next slide, um, uh, you know, when you are solving a problem together, this is really a metaphor uh, for joint cognition and problem solving. The reason why DevOps worked is that we had accidentally decoupled DevOps, where the information flow between them far exceeded the channels that were available between Steve and Gene. So you should see a couch on the top, two chairs on the bottom. We'd accidentally turned uh, DevOps into two chairs <laughs> that uh, they move independently when they're actually hiding coupled uh, together. So if I can just uh, share with you why I'm so excited about this metaphor. So the Amazon e-commerce transformation was uh, essentially 3,500 software engineers all coupled to one couch, where to get even small things done uh, required coordinating with everybody else attached to that couch. Um, and so the, their countermeasure was to chop up the couch into smaller pieces, hundreds and later thousands that re-liberated uh, and regained independence of action for those individual teams. Interestingly, uh, 20 years later, uh, Amazon Prime Video uh, you know, published this infamous blog post uh, where they talked about how Amazon Prime Video, they moved from microservices back into a monolith. And that is as if they had chopped up the couch too small because the majority of the time was spent coordinating and transporting, copying data in and out of S3 buckets, right? Indicating that uh, they had lost cohesion. So the solution was to glue all those couches back together again, back into one couch so that uh, we could regain coupling and regain cohesion so that uh, we could actually, so those teams would work as a unified whole. So uh, if you go to the Winston Churchill quote, Dan, I love this quote, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. So too, as leaders, we create the architecture of the organization forever after they shape us. Uh, Dan, does that resonate with you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, the team I referenced earlier, um, one of the big challenges they've got is how do we organize all the people, right? If you, can, um, if you can take a code base and you can break it down into modular units, then it, you can do distributed development all across the country. If you've got a monolith, everyone has to work in the same building, right? So this has implications for a lot of the work from home conversations um, we're having today. A lot of the code bases that we've got weren't built for that. So we have to modularize if we want to allow people to work all across the country and from their houses. And uh, maybe one little nuance there is that uh, it is and it is possible to modularize a monolith like Amazon Prime Video did, where you can still have uh, independence of action um, without the uh, massive potential coordination cost of having to coordinate hundreds of people. Yeah. And, and um, you know, this kind of relates to open source, right? Open source code tends to be much more modular. Well, open source communities um, uh, tend to be distributed <laughs> and they tend to be... Um, you know, all distributed all over the world with looser communication channels. So they have the perfect organization for writing decoupled code. So, Absolutely. And, and I'll just make yeah. one little note is that, and that explains the incredible innovation, distributed innovation that's happening, right? Uh, has happened that we can observe in open source. Okay, over to you, Dan. Yeah, Linux is completely modular and and uh, it's taken over the world. So, you know, I, I like your couch metaphor. Here's some metaphors I often use. Um, in our research, we use the word core when we're talking about a tangled knot within a code base that is difficult. The, the picture on the left is, and I'm not gonna get into these forms of visualizations. We can talk about that if, if we wanted to have a more technical discussion, but you know, we can f find hotspots within code bases and visualize them where you've got some major challenges. And in, in that part of the code, there were a lot of issues in that organization. Um, we talk about spaghetti code. I often use this metaphor of a fishing line. Like if you've got your kid and they pop their spool, as a dad, you're trying to untangle it for 30 minutes while they've got your rod. And you know, if you had tools that would tell you exactly which thread to pull at which time and in which direction, you could probably untangle it in about 30 seconds. But because we as human beings can't um, think that fast, we don't have brains big enough to do that math problem, it can take forever or you can never get it done. And, and that's kind of like what goes on in code, right? If you knew exactly what to do, and so we have computer-assisted tools to help people know what to do and how to how to pull it apart. And then examples of you know you said if you're going to decouple it, you've got chairs. Um, you know if you're um, if you each have your own chair and you can carry it and you don't have to coordinate, and that's like having a, a, a well modularized um, code base that's cohesive um, between the job you have to do and and the technology you're working with. And you know Mr. Potato Head is modular because it has APIs and all of those different things can plug into all of those different holes. Legos, it's different kind of modularization. I also like Tootsie Pops because uh, 
you know, you've got to access the Tootsie Pop through the API, which is the hard candy shell, and and you're not supposed to, um, you know, take a bite to to get to the middle. So those are the metaphors that I like to use. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. So you know, one of the grand goals of uh, writing the wiring winning organization, I was so delighted, is to create a common parlance that technology leaders and business business leaders can use. And so on uh, the first slide, uh, it shows some of the fantastic quotes and testimonies we got from some of the technology leaders that I admire most. But on the next slide, it shows uh, testimonials from uh, people outside the technology leadership community showing that uh, you know these concepts absolutely resonate with them. So uh, this has just been an incredible adventure working with uh, Dr. Steven Spear. And uh, uh, one of the big rewards Boards for me was explaining and finally understanding why architecture and modularity are so important. Uh, and the next last slide I have is uh, if anyone is interested in uh, watching those DevOps Enterprise videos from Walmart, Target, Project Fox, if people want excerpts of Wearing the Winning Organization, just send an email to realgenekim at sendyourslides.com, search line DevOps, and you'll get an automated response right away. And I I'm so grateful that Silver Thread is uh, making uh, complimentary copies of this book available for uh, some number of registrants. So, thank you, Dan, and back over to you. Oh, thank you. So, um, and we'll, you know, we'll be um, sending out some books um, as well as, you know, um, you know, plug as as a company. We've got uh, offerings including Codemry Discovery, which is uh, more about uh, looking across an organization and understanding the healthier code. Uh, and uh, the business implications so you can make strategic calls and have visibility at the executive level. And then we have Codemry Modernize, which is uh, tooling and, and uh, services and solutions around driving health into your code base in a systematic, um, well-understood, well-manageable way. Um, so, um, and we'll be giving away uh, free uh, Codemry Diagnostic to, to someone on this call. Um, so with that, I think we should open it up for questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I have some questions. I'll uh, kind of direct them to one of you, and then you both obviously can feel free to add in or weigh in as you see fit. Um, let's see, to start, um, what are some of the practices or best practices that should be used to adopt modular architecture? Maybe, Dan, you start, and then, Jean, you can add in. Well, I guess the question is if you're starting um, from scratch or if you're taking a legacy system and, and um, driving it to be modular. Um, from the outset, I think you know you want to define within your code base um, which sections of that code, which source code files belong to each module. Um, you want to have a formal definition around um, uh, how that module gets built, right? Um, each one should build itself. Um, you should have dependencies between them. You should understand whether they're build or test or runtime dependencies. Um, and each of those modules should define APIs and, and uh, have a formal mechanism for doing that and then maintaining uh, control over that by measuring, um, you know, how the system behaves during its build and, and test process as well as, you know, statically how it behaves and, and just continuously audit that that your, your code for conformance with the architecture that you want to have. If you don't do that, the challenge is that, you know, you have, you have uh, senior leaders thinking the system is one thing, but then you hire interns that do something completely different and you have no way to know and it gets completely tangled up. Um, if, you wanna, if you want to recover it, you, um, you know, can go through a systematic process of auditing those things, measuring um, violations of what I would call those rules of modularity, and then, and then refactoring um, in, a, in a state where you can measure and visualize the issue in a structured way. Okay. Jean, anything to add, or should I go to the next question? Oh, <laughs> fantastic. I th think that's great. I think the big um, uh, advice I would give is just ask yourself a question, regardless of where you are in the organization, team lead, architect, uh, developer, uh, infrastructure engineer, is to what extent can you get done uh, what you need to get done easily and well? Uh, are you talking to too many people? Do you have to do a lot of communication and coordination, right? And I think those will give you a lot of clues about where there is a uh, um, um, coupling that is causing uh, too much coordination cost. And that might be because uh, too many people are coupled to the couch, or maybe we accidentally uh, cut the couches too small. Yep. Okay. Um, next question, Jean, maybe you can start it off. Um, given that architecture is one of the pr predictors of performance, what was the earliest evidence that led you to that conclusion? 
Oh yeah. Uh, in fact, um, earliest evidence was for 20 years. The people I admired most uh, were had the words chief architect in their title. <laughs> and uh, I've got to say, I've read so many books trying to understand the marks of great architecture. And uh, so uh, the, the finding in the state of DevOps research to really kind of concretize that it really is about independence of action. To what degree can teams get done what they need to get done without having to uh, communicate and coordinate with everybody and they have uh, because they're decoupled and have cohesion. Uh, I mean, I think that was like one of the biggest discoveries of my career. Um, and so uh, the, my conversation with Dan uh, recently, that finding with the state of DevOps research has been so satisfying and uh, i'm just so delighted that it is really the core one of the core concepts in the wiring the winning organization book and just one little trivia fact there's another way to simplify uh systems and that's called linearization linearization does for sequential processes what modularization does for parallel processes so when you look at an assembly line the Toyota production process, or a continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline. Those are uh, also creating independence of action between devs, build engineers, security engineers, integration tests, uh, security, and so forth. So it allows them to not just be automated, but uh, to actually do improvements independent of each other. Uh, Dan, does that resonate with you? Oh, absolutely. I, I think I would, I would say that I, you know, I read a lot of Alan McCormack and Carlos Baldwin's research, and Alan had an interesting experience in his career. He was a a researcher studying how um, agile processes were impacting business performance. And so he went around to lots of organizations like Red Hat, Netscape, and others, and did big study, um, uh, survey-based studies and others, um, where he was talking to tons of people um, asking, you know, is it pair programming? Is it stand-up meetings? Is it sprint? <laughs> you know, what is it? And, and person after person after person would say, yeah, but the architecture, or I can't because of the architecture. And he had no construct for that. He had no way of, of knowing. And so he'd say, what do you mean by the architecture? And people would say, um, people would say, well, you know, it's modular. And he'd say, okay, what's that mean? And then go to the whiteboard and draw it. And they would all go and they would draw their, what they meant by the modular architecture on the whiteboard. They're all drawing block diagrams. That's what we all do. Um, so he set out to actually measure it because he's a researcher. He can't, can't have a big unexplained variable that there's no way to actually measure it. <laughs> you know? And so um, Alan and Carlos worked together to come up with a way of mining code and measuring modularity in it. And for 18 months, um, all these developers that they were working with told them that they had modular systems and their graph theoretic algorithms could not find that modularity. They thought their algorithms were broken. They kept trying to debug their uh, algorithms until they realized that no, their algorithms were fine. The entire software industry was wrong. 80% of these code bases are nowhere near modular um, uh, in the way that the developers thought that they were. And so I think one of the big findings there is that it's a huge cognitive problem, right? People don't, you know, these, these systems are way too big for any human brain to really comprehend. So we need to have tools to, to understand, um, you know, this kind of health and fix it. Okay. Awesome. Great. Thank you both. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Dan. Um, I think we've reached the end of our time. So I appreciate everybody that's been able to join us today. Um, we will be sending out a recording of this video um, shortly um, after today. And again, thanks for everybody for joining. Thank you. Thank you.